Secession by Alexander H. Stevens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Secession Mr. President, this step of secession once taken can never be recalled, and all the baleful and withering consequences that must follow will rest on the convention for all coming time. When we and our posterity shall see our lovely South desolated by the demon of war, which this act of yours will inevitably invite and call forth, when our green fields of waving harvest shall be trodden down by the murderous soldiery and fiery car of war, sweeping over our land, our temples of justice laid in ashes, all the horrors and desolation of war upon us, who but this convention will be held responsible for it? Who but him who shall have given his vote for the unwise and ill-timed measure, as I honestly think and believe, shall be held to strict account for this suicidal act by the present generation, and probably cursed and execrated by posterity for all coming time? for the wide and desolating ruin that will inevitably follow this act you now propose to perpetrate. Pause, I entreat you, and consider for a moment what reasons you can give that will even satisfy yourselves in calmer moments. What reason you can give to your fellow sufferers in the calamity that it will bring upon us. What reason can you give the nations of the earth to justify it? They will be the calm and deliberate judges in this case. And what cause or one overt act can you name or point on which to rest the plea of justification? What right has the North assailed? What interest of the South has been invaded? What justice has been denied? And what claim founded in justice and right has been withheld? Can either of you today name one governmental act of wrong deliberately and purposely done by the government of Washington? of which the South has a right to complain. I challenge the answer. While on the other hand, let me show the facts, of which I wish you to judge, and I will only state the facts, which are clear and undeniable, and which now stand as records authentic in the history of our country. When we of the South demanded the slave trade, or the importation of Africans for the cultivation of our lands, did they not yield the right for twenty years? When we asked a three-fifths representation in Congress for our slaves, was it not granted? when we asked and demanded the return of any fugitive from justice or the recovery of those persons owing labor or allegiance, was it not incorporated in the Constitution, and again ratified and strengthened by the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850? But do you reply that in many instances they have violated this compact and have not been faithful to their engagements? As individual and local communities 
they may have done so, but not by the sanction of government, for that has always been true to Southern interests. Again, gentlemen, look at another act. When we have asked that more territory should be added, that we might spread the institution of slavery, have they not yielded to our demands in giving us Louisiana, Florida, and Texas? From these four states have been carved, and ample territory for four more is to be added in due time. If you, by this unwise and impolitic act, do not destroy this hope and perhaps by it lose all, and have your last slave wretched from you by stern military rule as South America and Mexico were, or by the vindictive decree of a universal emancipation which may reasonably be expected to follow. But again, gentlemen, what have we to gain by this proposed change of our relation to the general government? We have always had the control of it, and can yet, if we remain in it, and are as united as we have been. We have had a majority of the presidents chosen from the South, as well as the control and management of most of those chosen from the North. We have had 60 years of Southern presidents to their 24, thus controlling the executive department. So of the judges of the Supreme Court, we have had 18 from the South and but 11 from the North although nearly four-fifths of the judicial business has arisen in the free states. Yet a majority of the court has always been from the South. This we have required so as to guard against any interpretation of the Constitution unfavorable to us. In like manner, we have been equally watchful to guard our interests in the legislative branch of government. In choosing the presidents of the Senate, we have had 24 to their 11. Speakers of the House, we have had 23 and they 12, while the majority of the representatives from the greater population have always been from the North yet we have generally secured the Speaker, because he, to a great extent, shapes and controls the legislation of the country. Nor have we had less control in every other department of the general government. Attorney Generals, we have had 14, while the North have had but five. Foreign ministers, we have had 86, and they but 54. While three-fourths of the business, which demands diplomatic agents abroad, is clearly from the free states, from their greater commercial interest. Yet we have had the principal embassies, so as to secure the world markets for our cotton, tobacco, and sugar on the best possible terms. We have had a vast majority of the higher offices of both Army and Navy, while a larger proportion of the soldiers and sailors were drawn from the North. Again, from official documents, we learn that a fraction over three-fourths of the revenue collected for the support of the government, has uniformly been raised from the North. Leaving out of view, for the present, the countless millions of dollars you must expend in a war with the North, with tens of thousands of your sons and brothers slain in battle and offered up as sacrifices upon the altar of your ambition, 
And for what? We ask again, is it for the overthrow of the American government established by our common ancestry, cemented and built up by their sweat and blood, and founded on the principles of right, justice, and humanity? And as such, I must declare here, as I have often done before, and which has been repeated by the greatest and wisest of statesmen and patriots in this and other lands, that it is the best and freest government, the most equal in its rights, the most just in its decisions, the most lenient in its measures, and the most aspiring in its principles, to elevate the race of men that the Son of Heaven ever shone upon. Now for you to attempt to overthrow such a government as this, under which we have lived for more than three quarters of a century, in which we have gained our wealth, our standing as a nation, our domestic safety, while the elements of peril are around us, with peace and tranquility accompanied with unbounded prosperity and rights unassailed, is the height of madness, folly, and wickedness, to which I neither lend my sanction nor my vote. Footnote Delivered at the Georgia State Convention, January 1861. End footnote. Recording by Robert Scott, Mojo Move 411.com, M O J O M O V E 411.com. September the 18th. 2007.